This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office Podcast from My Campaign Coach. Today we're talking to another Ted Cruz presidential campaign alumni, Dr. Mark Campbell. Mark's winning career spans more than three decades, and his client list includes presidents, presidential candidates, and hundreds of federal, state, and local candidates across the country. He takes on tough races and has a very strong record of success, even in Democratic strongholds. Mark's resume is as extensive as it is varied. He's done everything from managing campaigns, consulting on them, serving as national spokesman for the Republican Party, and training conservative leaders both nationally and internationally. Most recently, Mark served as national political director for the Ted Cruz for President campaign, and now he's focused full-time on running Intel's opposition research and strategy. You should recognize that name, Intel's, from our interviews earlier this year with John Lappy and Mick Paskowitz. While we talked a lot with them about the opposition research side of the Intel's operation, our conversation today is going to focus on strategy and preparing to pull the trigger on your campaign. We want to dive in deep into the steps that you should take before a campaign begins and common pitfalls that a lot of campaigns face during their tenure. Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Well, it's a pleasure. It's good to uh, get the final member of the Intel shop, the founding member and final guy to come on the podcast. I, I appreciate you coming on today. Well, it's, it's appropriate that the one with the most gray hair goes last, so that's fine. <laughs> Very, very good. So let's start out a little bit talking about where you got started. It's, you've been in this business a long time, touched every part of campaigns during your tenure. What got you started in it? Well, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, <laughs> I started in this business. And uh, it's been a 40-year love-hate relationship. Um, I actually grew up in a pretty political family. Members uh, of my family, not my immediate family, but my family were in Bill Cahill's cabinet. Bill Cahill's a former governor of New Jersey. So when I was growing up as a kid, I thought every fall was football season and campaign season. So I've literally been working in a campaign every year since I was four. And when I was four wow. years old, I, I was hanging door hangers on, on doors. <laughs> so it, it is it is not unusual for me, no matter how much someone's paying me, to still be putting up chairs or making coffee or doing whatever. Because if you grow up in this business or you know anything about this business, everybody does everything. And uh, so uh, I think I've got a little bit of wisdom. And you know what the definition of an experienced consultant is? What's that? It is somebody who has made every single mistake multiple times and is still in business. That, <laughs> well, there's not many of those out there. You're definitely one of them. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the definition of a, of a wise sage, somebody who has all the slings and arrows but is still ticking. Oh, that's, that's impressive. And I, I love that you mentioned the fact that there's no job too small even still because you know, a lot of our listeners are – they're either looking to run for office or you know, many of them want a job in politics. They have a passion for it and they want to grow up and get involved or graduate and get involved in a full-time job. And every single episode, it seems like when we're talking to folks, just one of those keys and everybody we've had on is they've grown up and still to this day, there is no job too small, putting up chairs, you know, filling up cups, filling out signing forms. It doesn't matter. It's, it's about the small jobs. Well, if you think you're too important, you're soon to be unemployed. So. <laughs> I'm sure that you've had you've had a lot of people that have uh, that have jumped on that side of the unemployment line by by not doing the small jobs and doing them well. Well, I think there are a few people who have gone on to more exciting careers in other fields like retail, fast food. <laughs> I've had a few of those myself. It's uh, yeah. It's it's always just mind boggling. It's like, wait a second, the boss is willing to do those small things. They want to take out the trash and clean the bathroom, but not the new guy. I, that's never well, made sense to me. Well, it's it's interesting. When when we run a grassroots program, we make everybody do every job. So even if you might be somebody who has endorsed a client of mine, we still want you to call your neighbors. We still want you to send postcards. We still want you to do all of those things. Because nothing beats neighbors talking to neighbors, especially in this specialized world uh, of technology and, uh, and Twitter and Snap. Snapchat, the best thing you can possibly do is people actually face-to-face -face talking to other people. No doubt. 
Well, you, you've got a, uh, I think out of all the people we've had on here, you're the, you're one of the few that have beat me as far as entry into the door knocking side of politics. I got started when I was 10 and I, I haven't ever had anybody beat me that early as far as force. That's, that's pretty awesome. Well, you know, the, the, the fact is, um, you know, what happens at volunteer fire companies and churches, synagogues, uh, you know, uh, folks talking to other folks about uh, things going on in the world and campaigns and camp candidates uh, is still more important than a, uh, a targeted Facebook list. Yes, sir. Uh, and I, I know it's easier to do a Facebook ad than it is to knock on a thousand doors, but uh, I'll put my money on a thousand doors anytime. Well, I think that comes back to the, what you uh, define as the wise sage thing. There's a lot of people out there that they want to do, especially on the consultant side, that want to do the easy thing, the one that requires the least overhead, the smallest staff, and the least grunt work. And that's not always how you win elections. That, the matter of fact, is rarely how you win elections. And so well, well, yourself actually, knows that. Actually, you left out the most important thing and makes them the most money. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of block walking that comes with the the, the percentage pass through rate to to the yeah. consultant. That's <laughs> yeah, how exactly. that works. Well, exactly, but you know, and and just uh, it's all important. Like every aspect of the campaign is important. Uh, but I have normally found that in the search for undecided voters, uh, the internet is not generally where where they reside. So looking back to when this became more than a, a passion for you. So you started out when you were four. At some point along the way, you obviously you got fully bit by the bug and addicted to this thing. And then you probably had to find a way to make money doing it. So how did that transition from passion to, to professional? Well, uh, it's in interesting because um, having you know volunteered significantly my entire life, um, I actually... Um, was uh, right out of graduate school, I was uh, named a uh, presidential management intern, which is now the presidential fellows program. And I wound up uh, back in Philadelphia working for the Small Business Administration. And just about that time, there was a very hot district attorney's race, a gentleman by the name of Ron Castile was running. So I played a very prominent role uh, in, in that. Uh, and then I ran a city council race against a multi-year Democrat incumbent in South Philadelphia, which for most people out there is a, is a Democratic stronghold, um, lost only by a couple hundred votes. And then a couple of years later came back and uh, ran Connie McHugh, a wonderful civic leader that we actually won the state rep seat. And as a result of those campaigns i was noticed by folks because basically i was doing campaigns nobody wanted right, right? those they are not easy beat. campaigns right you can't win what are you doing et cetera, et cetera. well you win one of them and all of a sudden i was asked to work for um bush 41 in pennsylvania a wonderful woman by the name of elsie Hel hellman uh was very close to the bush family and, and elsie asked me to work on behalf of the president and after that, the rest was history. And during this time, I also had a lobbying company in Pennsylvania. And I got so well known on the campaign side that I had to, actually had to give up the lobbying side because the Democrats finally figured out what I was doing. And they uh, had a hard time me being a, both a lobbyist and a political op operative. And they said, since I kept making their caucus smaller, <laughs> that they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't going to support any of my clients any, anymore. <laughs> so I did the dumb thing. Uh, I expanded my political operation, which is 200 times more work for 25% of the money. And the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, but this, this is where we have the real fun, right? Yeah, well, yeah, you know what? Um, after 40 years, I'm not quite sure whether it's a walk in the park or political proctology. It's somewhere right in, right in between. It may depend on the day or the hour. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting. Um, I think one of the big changes that has happened recently is we are becoming a much more parliamentary form of government, i.e. people are voting much more straight party lines because they think they know what both parties, quote unquote, stand for. And what's being lost is the importance of the individual candidate in the campaign. So for all of you out there, you really have to work very, very hard to make sure that you identify your candidate as a unique product and what has become sort of a, a straight party line in, environment. 
Do you think we're going to see any shift away from that in the near future? I mean, we see a lot of this with so many people reacting on a very visceral level to Democrats or Republicans looking at, you know, a Hillary or a Trump. I mean, are we going to see a little bit of breakdown in that cohesive you know, party line image? I'm just wondering what you think about that. Well, you know, exit polls showed that less than 5% of Republican primary voters voted for Clinton and pretty much the same uh, numbers over on the other side. So if anything, I think we'll go through more of a period of uh, realignment along party lines. Um, I think that um, uh, President Trump um, really gets a rise out of people, both good and bad. And right. I think that that kind of passion uh, is not going to wane in the upcoming mid mid midterms. No. But, you know, I guess if there's one thing I'd like uh, everyone to sort of take away from today, and it's what I call the I-80 learning lesson. I was at 3 o'clock in the morning at a rest stop in Iowa, and a waitress came, and I was reading a paper, and the front line of the paper was about a local politician that had been indicted. And this, this very nice um, older lady looked at me and said, she, she said, damn it, I just want to vote for somebody who is like me, with whom I share values, is smarter than me, and doesn't act like it. And I said, excuse me, could you say that again so I can write it down? <laughs> yeah, right. So I made a career off of understanding that voters just want to vote for somebody whom they share, they share values with, that they believe would act the way they would act if they were elected. But they want that person to be smarter, but they don't want that person to act all stuck up. And that's, that's really the key good. to this business. I mean, that is the key to this business. So most folks know that they don't have the time, energy, uh, or interest to run for office. But if, but if they did, they would want to vote for someone that has a lot in common with them. So I think that we are moving to an era of shared values. And I think the biggest thing that talk radio um, and you know all, uh, the alt news universe and all that did – was basically pull together groups of people who share common values and thoughts uh, and pull them out of what you know we used to call the mainstream media so that so that everybody is now and the other thing that's fascinating is going on is we're getting away from broadcasting back to narrow band casting the people no longer are searching for lots of different news from lots of different people they are looking for news from folks that generally agree with them and I think that is also going to lend itself to this uh, par parliamentary approach. You know, I think it's a little bit sad that we all can't, I mean, please forgive me. This is the most, uh, this is a pitiful thing to say, but to some degree, can't we just get along? <laughs> I mean, just to, right. you know, to some degree, we just have to listen to each other occasionally. And right now, I just, it, it just feels like everyone's so busy yelling at each other that no one's really listening. Well, I just got done talking with Chris Wilson on one of our, our most recent podcasts. You, you obviously work with Chris very closely on the Cruise for President campaign. And we we're talking about how the shift from do you have any survey research model to more of a, a straight analytical model where you actually target voters, not just demographics, individuals, right. not percentages. Yep. And I really love that because my whole background is block walking, grassroots, you know, direct voter contact. And it excites me that it seems we might be turning back from that broadcasting more to, to what does the actual voter care about? How do I how do I message to you, not just you know a percentage of people that might someday be like you? Sure, and and you know the, there were many fantastic things about the uh, Cruz camp campaign. Uh, Jeff Rowe did a fantastic job managing, and Chris Wilson did a tremendous job on the uh, data analytics and polling side. And, you know, I got a lot of credit for building the most extensive grassroots political organization that's been built in recent memory. But to be perfectly honest, I cheated. What we did is Chris Wilson built a model of who would be the most enthusiastic Cruz supporter. We were able to ID them, and then we had a whole program sort of targeted at those votes to volunteer. So uh, we were a very, very, very heavy ground game 
organization. The only reason we were able to beat Trump in Iowa, Wisconsin, and a number of other states is because of really extensive door-to-door and grassroots cam- cam- campaign. And oh, by the way, that is a massive team effort. The regional political directors were fantastic. Our state folks were, 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 were uh, fantastic. But the most fantastic asset, um, asset we had um, was uh, Ted Cruz and Heidi Cruz. And what I find most fascinating is that most people who voted for Trump actually were looking for Cruz, but he didn't have a reality TV show for 15 <laughs> years. So, I mean, there has never been a bigger outsider to come to Washington than Ted, Ted uh, Cruz. So yeah. it's, it's interesting to watch now, but it was, it was uh, a great team. Uh, Ted's chief of staff now is a, da- a guy by the name of David uh, Polyansky, who came in and did a uh, fan- fantastic job also. So uh, Ted is, uh, is surrounded by a very competent, smart, brilliant team. And let me just say this to all of your listeners. Anybody who ever has a chance to have a glass of wine or have a beer or a chocolate chip cookie with Ted Cruz should because he's one of the most engaging, personable, decent, honest, wonderful men that I've ever met in my entire life. And and I don't like anybody. So. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I, you haven't got to know Ted for, gosh, you know, seven or so years and got to work closely with him. He's just a genuinely great guy. He's a good person to spend time with and, and a good man. Uh, it's part yes, of why, he is. why both of us work so hard for him. And, Part of why I got such a great team around him. It was, it was definitely an impressive group. We had you know, John McClone, who was one of your regional political directors. He was on a few weeks ago, and I'm going to have to talk Sawyer into coming on at some point, get round out most of the, uh, the senior crew. But you guys did a wonderful job. I was proud to uh, proud to watch it and be part of the Super PAC side on the outside of those efforts. And uh, it was it was definitely one for the history books. I'm uh, yeah, got my hopes for, for down the line. We shall see. <laughs> exactly. So one of the other things on your resume that I think just really pops out is when you talk about your work internationally with emerging democracies and helping train people in, in right. elections over there. Talk a little bit more about what that is and how you got involved with it. Well, <clears throat> there's um, uh, most of the other uh, emerging democracies and democracies around the world greatly admire what we do here in the U.S., um, on the Republican side, there's an organization called IRI, the International Republican Inst- Institute, uh, which, along with their uh, Democrat colleagues, sponsor trips o- o- overseas. And some of these efforts are supported by the State Department, and some aren't. And uh, I was fortunate enough to go to places like uh, in Indonesia and the U- U- uh, Ukraine. And one of the interesting things about the Ukraine is we got there right after um, they were going, or right before they were going to have their first set of national e- elections. And um, one of the things I always try and do when I go to a country is get out of out of the capital. There's just no point being part of the echo chamber in, in the capital. So we're out in some of the more rural areas. And what we basically did is we all of the pro-democracy candidates, they sounded like the communists, they dressed like the communists, they acted like the communists, because that's all they knew. That's what a politician looks like, right? right. So I took them all to um, a marketplace, and I made them write down all the transactional language that, that they heard. How did people normally greet each other? How did they talk? What words, words uh, did they use to, to buy and sell? And then I then uh, then we came back and I made them rewrite their stump speeches based on the words that they heard at, heard at the marketplace. And we developed like a list of 20, 25 words that they could never say. And so that was a really fun exercise. We basically had to take wonderful people and let them be wonderful people and stop having them sound like some uh, robotic communist. So that was fun. Um, and. You know, the thing that you learn is is basically around the world, people want the same thing. They basically just want to be able to raise, raise their family, have enough to eat, and they don't want the, a tyrannical government stepping on them. That's pretty cool, and I like that exercise you guys went through. I think a lot of a lot of candidates here in the States could, could benefit from a similar exercise. Well, you know, um, 
I have a lot of respect for anyone who, you know, who uh, laces up the boots and, and, and gets in the game, male or fem- female, because it's, it's certainly not an easy thing. So, you know, anybody who's, who's, who's got the guts to get in the game deserves a, a good, honest team to help them. So. so what do you guys do from the Intel side? You guys obviously do the, the opposition research we talked with John and Mick about. But on the strategy side, with using your GC services and your experience there, what else do you guys do for campaigns, and how do you serve them? Sure. Well, you know, a lot of what we do for campaigns, um, even on the GC side, you know, we we, we operationalize uh, through our opposition research because not only do you get the opposition research, but exactly how we would use it if we were GC in the race. Or if it's a vulnerability study, exactly how we would use what what we found against our our, our client. Um, you know, we will do the GC on one or two races a year, and we really act as a super manager. Um, and because you know we're in contact every every single day, so our definition of GC in a race is not exactly your your normal GC, GC model. Um, and it works for us because we tend to do races that are tough. I mean, we, we tend to do a lot of races in the Northeast, mid-Atlantic, mid-West, where uh, general elections are very, very com- com- uh, competitive. Um, and, you know, uh, we've won, I'd say I actually gc the closest congressional race in the 1990s, the 2000s, and, and then uh, in the two. 2000 plus era. So I am used to winning congressional races by a couple hundred votes. Um, I've probably done more recounts than any other <laughs> re- Republican. That's where the and, gray hair uh, came from. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think I was born, born with it. I, I can't remember a time when it, when it was dark. Oh, well. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, so I know that there are probably some folks listening to this who are trying to figure out, like, what's the most important thing? Well, the first thing is shared values with voters. The second thing is a very clear and concise message. Everybody in America, whether you voted for Trump or not, knew what his campaign slogan was, right? Make yep. America great, great again. As a matter of fact, it was so simple and so direct, people made fun of it, but it was absolutely brilliant. Nobody can tell you what Hillary Clinton's campaign was about. Not a bit. And, you know, and, and it's it's um, it's fascinating that her political team with as much experience as they had just never seemed to really figure out uh, why people should vote for, for her. And what's in, interesting, and the reason that's important is most voters uh, are not paying attention until they have to. Right. You know, most voters are busy trying to pick up their dry cleaning, taking the kids to school. Uh, They're not reading the 10 point plan that I hope you didn't spend a lot of time writing because not a lot of people are going to read it. You know what the main purpose of a 10 10 page plan is to say you have one. (laughs) People go, oh, well, that's good. They they have a 10, you know, a a 10 page plan. Are you going to read it? Hell no. I'm not going to read it, but it's good to know they have one. (laughs) So so. you know, and then the other thing is in every single race, there is an absolute number of votes that you need need to win. Nothing is more impressive when you're trying to raise money than if you go to a donor and say, you know what, I need 172,319 votes to win, and I know exactly where I'm going to get the votes. What I really need is you to max out of my campaign so I can do X, Y, and Z to get, get those votes. And, and they go, well, how did you get that number? You say, well, I analyzed every election in the last 20 years, new housing developments, people moving in and out, and based on them. And, and the checks get bigger when people think you know what the hell you're doing. And anybody who says anything stupid, like, well, it's 50% plus one or one more <laughs> than the other guy, you just want to whack them upside the head. Because, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because you know raising raising money is hard, and also don't ever think you know how someone is going to react before you ask. About 25 years ago, I was helping a woman candidate in Western Pennsylvania, and I was going door to door with her because she thought going door to door was a waste of time. I mean, this is the old story, right? right? Nobody wants to do the hard stuff. 
So she started to walk past this house that had a yard sign for the Democratic candidate for state Senate. She was a Republican running for the state house, and she was going to walk past the house. I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, obviously, they're a Democratic household. I said, you don't know that. So we, And she hemmed and hawed, and we went up, and we knocked on the door, and the very lovely lady who let us in said, oh, honey, it's so nice to meet you. Come and sit, sit down. You know, What can I help help you with? And just just for fun, I said, well, she could really use $1,000 for her campaign, at which time she almost fell out of her chair to the <laughs> candidate. Not, not, not the lady. And she goes, oh, I'd be happy to. She got up, got her checkbook, wrote, wrote her, you know, a thousand dollar check. And then since I was doing so well so far, I just said, <laughs> how come you have a, a, a yard sign for the for the Democratic candidate for the for the Senate? She goes, oh, that thing. My son went to, went to school with him. I, do, I don't I don't. Not only do I not know the guy, but but I'm not voting for him. Oh my gosh! So, yeah, now I couldn't have planned this. I couldn't have planned this any better than it than it worked out. But it, you know, it's just interesting. You just don't know until until you ask. It's it's sort of like your first date, right? Yeah, you gotta ask. The answer is always no, unless you go and ask. I don't know. I didn't have too many people saying no no to me, but. You know, it's just... <laughs> Well, that was a joke. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> very, very nice. Well, that yeah, that's perfect anecdote. I mean, you you could not have written that better, even if you'd have just no, been making it's it up. Great. And I've wow. told that story for twenty plus years. You obviously have a very strong focus and strong belief in that ground game. What are some of the things that you look at when you're trying to build it out? As far as standard things that you are, think are important to anybody's ground game. Well. Um, it's important to understand that the purpose of a ground game is not to get people to believe things they don't already believe, okay? Um, we're now in an era in politics where a, a ground game or a campaign, the primary purpose is to identify people who might be for you, convince them that they should be for, for you, get them to commit, and then get them out to vote. And, and uh, there are some very sophisticated programs and voter lists, um, you know, uh, for ex ex uh, example, um, it is, um, you know, there are lists out there of folks that who have been identified with all the, the, the tendencies to vote for Trump. So you could basically uh, know exactly what to say to those voters based on past vote, vote, vote history. Um, the the level of sophistication on the Republican side has grown exponentially beyond what the Democrats have on 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 their side, and I basically believe it's because the Democrats have turned into a loosely affiliated group of edge special interests who are more concerned about themselves as individual groups than they are at, with anyone as a whole. And, you know, thank God, because, right. uh, you know, because I, you know, because, you know, whether um, no matter what anybody thinks or whatever the approval ratings are of the president come the mid midterms, the Democrats think they lost the presidency because they didn't do the same thing hard e enough. They didn't learn anything. <laughs> they learned absolutely right. nothing. They they think that they just didn't push their special in, interests enough. Oh, thank God. Yeah, you know, and and uh, uh, you know, it's also funny um, to watch the uh, the uh, Democratic National Committee explain the Bernie Sanders thing. I mean, they screwed his brains out. Oh, it was so bad. <laughs> oh yeah, and 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 you know, and all the oh how. How how they're the party of generosity and honest and you know I mean boy if they didn't act like an organized crime group during that campaign I don't know who who did but they've hey. had a lot of practice but that was by far the most glaring public example I've seen in a while. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and you know can, you know listen if if anybody on the Republican side had done that DC oh. would still be burning. Absolutely.
Well, I'm, I'm oh, really surprised yeah. there's not more talk about the you know, breaking apart parties on the Democrat side than on the Republican when you've seen clearly that the Democrats in power up there are not never going to let the actual people that vote for them decide who their nominee is. It's just absolutely insane. Well, you know, the, the one thing that the Democrat Party learned a long time ago is, uh, you know, be careful if, if, if you give people a, people a choice, they won't do what, what you want. So, <laughs> hey. So when you're looking at potential clients, like you said, you are very selective about the people you work for. You pick these handful, these, these small number of, of tough races where you can be intimately involved in the entire process, which is, like as you mentioned, is is different than a lot of GCs. So sure. you've obviously got to have some, some pretty close criteria as far as what you look for in a client. What are some of those things, those filters you run it through? Well, you know, we always want to have the best candidate in the race. We always want to honestly believe that everything we're doing is not only good for business, but is honestly a public service. Now, that might sound, I don't know, kind of lame or, or, or uh, altruistic, but the fact is it's just too hard to do just for the money. And I've generally found that, uh, that you know, the folks that are in this business just for the money, they kind of get found out. I mean, you really have to have a passion, a passion for the for the uh, for the party. You've got to have a passion for people, and you actually want to. I mean, I got in politics originally because I thought that's what you did if you cared about your country and your city and your, <laughs> and your state. I, you know, I, I thought you tried to get good good people uh, elected, and you know. My advice for younger folks out there who are thinking about getting into this business or in the, in the early stages of, of this business, there are no shortcuts. There just aren't, unless you're the son and daughter of the Fortune 500 and you know wind up in some cush job out of college at the RNC, which are coming in harder and harder to come, come by. It's just hard work. The vast majority of people at the RNC and the House Committee and the Senate Committee um, have our, our experience, cam campaign managers, operatives, grass, grassroots folks, um, and there's no way to start in the, in the middle. Anybody out there who's trying to figure out how to get started, go run a city council race, go run a school board race, go do a state rep race, go do anything you can possibly do to start to build your resume. Um, and the other, you know, I guess I, I hate to say insightful, but you actually learn from the races that you lose and you gain experience from the races that you win. Um, and, you know, fortunately, I did most of my learning a number of years ago. Um, <laughs> but it is uh, but, you know, it, and, and, and any time you think, you know, everything, you're a fool and you know nothing. The most insightful things that I'll hear during the campaign will be some woman at a coffee shop or in a parking lot. You really have to be open and listening to what people are, are saying. And the other reason you want to run a grassroots campaign is I make all of the people who are going door to door in my campaigns report, report back to me the exact language that they're hearing because words actually matter. And right. so what we want to do is we, we want to play back to folks – uh, information in a way that they are used to saying it themselves or might be willing to to hear it because you will never convince anyone of something they don't already believe uh, so your job is to tap into their be belief system and um, and and be able to, to convince them that you are the best one that shares their values try to think of some good ways to go from here mark <clears throat> what, you got any other uh, areas kind of in this in this uh, yeah yeah no, yeah and you know uh, um, another thing that that you know young campaign industry people um, or older first time candidates need to need to understand is remain calm. The news cycle is now about five minutes long, and not every attack or problem deserves a response because you know. Um, don't tell anybody else. But one of the things that I used to do, well, I still still, still do, is I will attack my opponent with 80% of the truth 
And like clockwork, they'll come back and defend the 20%, which lets me talk about the 80% for another week. So, you know, sometimes you just let it go. If, if it doesn't hurt, if it doesn't make a difference, let it go. Uh, candidates, campaigns, and staff sometimes get rabbit's ears, and they think it's a ping, ping pong match. And my, ever, my other word of advice is please be nice to the spouse and family. You know, they, uh, you know, they're putting up with an, with an awful lot and they might not be getting to see their dad as often as, as they, they, they'd like. So we always tried to make an effort to make sure that we had a good relationship with the family and, and spouse because their name isn't on the ballot, but they suffer as, as if it is. And the other thing we do with a, with a potential client, the first thing I try and do is talk people out of running. Yes, sir. I, you know, because and 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 this is this is this, this is what I always say. I said the reason I'm talking you out of it is come September 15th when you're bitching and moaning at me about something, I want to be able to look at you and say, listen, listen, this was your idea. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I tried to talk you out of it? And then, so it's it's always nice to be able to sort of uh, you know. About the year previous com- conversation on the, on that note, but no kidding. Well, and that also gives you a good touchstone to go back to because it helps boil down why are they actually running. Because right. You get, to, you get to take apart all the arguments that don't really hold water, or that you know they're not going to be able to hold on to when it's September, and you figure out why are you actually running because that matters. Yeah. yeah, and and I you know I kind of think the reason general consultants are uh, are important is normally if a candidate can get past me they can get past their op- op- opponent i mean the hardest questions they're ever going to get and the most vicious attacks they're ever going to get are going to be from me sitting sitting in a meeting so that's the way know. it should be that's what's going to yeah. do them the most favors oh absolutely Ab- absolutely but you know the, the you know the thing that i've uh, the thing that I am sort of most proudest of is the friends that I've made o- over the years, uh, the relationships that we've built, the clients that we've served. And I just don't know any other industry other than this one. Well, other than being in a foxhole, right? I mean, I, I have heard that military relationships are a lot like political ones because you kind of go through a tussle, right? And, right. and you know, and the folks folks that band together – uh, for any type of a, uh, a a physical or strenuous or emotional effort, tend tend to be friends for life. I am positive that everyone on the cruise campaign will be a friend for life, uh, and uh, and I take a bullet for Ted and the in, entire team, and I'm positive that they do the same for me. So it's a great thing. It absolutely is. I mean, it's a true family. And some of those folks that I got to work with even back in the 2012 race when he was running for Senate, I mean, those close relationships are absolutely, I mean, they're beautiful. It's, it's really incredible to have those to rely on. And you see a lot of the same people working on the same campaigns because they, they, like, they, they like being around people they can trust. And once you built that, I mean, there's, there's far too many people in politics that you know that you can't trust. And uh, when you, once you find some you can, you like to stick around them. Yeah, you know, and, and it's also interesting because, you know, everything about politics fundamentally comes down to trust. Right. So, it, you know, it really is um, the gold standard uh, as it relates to issue positions, policies, relationships and things that 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 just say. And you are the gold standard in podcasts, so I am thrilled to be on today. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I think I just happen to be the only one that actually talks about how to win elections, so it's not hard to be a uh, gold standard in this, uh, in this specific niche I found. Hey, listen, I was 12, 12, 12 years old. I was in a track meet. I was the only one in my age group that, that showed up. I ran the race. I won. <laughs> I got the gold medal. I, I didn't tell anybody that I was the only one. <laughs> You just got to like, take a compliment, okay. pal. We'll, we'll, God, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll just cut that. This is the gold standard in campaigns <laughs> and election podcasts right here. Exactly. You heard it right from Mark Campbell. Exactly. <laughs> I like it. I appreciate it. All right, so Mark, a lot of these folks, you know, we have the campaign staff, and you've talked a little bit to them as far as how to get that first job and things are important there. 
as a first time candidate, I'm somebody you haven't been able to talk out of running. I'm passionate about it. I'm standing for principle. Uh, like Mick and I talked about a couple weeks ago, we, I, I mean, I'm trying to embody the the three fundamentals: stand for principle, don't lie, and be nice to people. That we came up with those as yep. the, the three most important yes. things in the campaign. So I'm dedicated to that, but I'm trying to plan out my campaign because I know that if I just pull the trigger and I do kind of the fire ready aim approach, that I'm screwed. What are yep. some of the things that I need to make sure I'm planning out and building out before I pull that trigger? Well, first you need to. Re remain calm because not everything is going to go exactly the way you want. But one of the mantras for us is run every campaign like a business and every business like a campaign. You really do need a business plan. Starts with um, how many votes do I need to win? How am I going to get, get those votes? Uh, what is the environment of the district or state that I'm running in? Um, you know, uh, did they, did they vote for Trump? Did they vote for Clinton? Did they vote for Obama? Or was it uh, you know, uh, another can candidate? Am I running in the off year, the even year? Is it a presidential year or not? Um, you know, and I, if anyone hasn't read The Art of War yet by Sun Tzu, if you're in, in this business, uh, you know, it's the, it's the second most valuable book you can have in your Election. Um, most battles are won bef before they're fought. And if you have a well planned out campaign, because one of the things we pride ourselves in is we will kind of game out the whole camp campaign. And once you launch an attack, you'd be you'd better be ready to keep a steady drum beat because when, when we were all growing up as kids, you were three places that you could play, right? You could play at your house, you could play at your friend's house, you could play at a neutral lo location. If you played at a neutral location, sometimes you won, sometimes they, they won. You played at your friend's house, his house, his rules, he won. Well, politics is the art of playing at your house, where it's your rules, your turf, your playgrounds. So if you command the field and keep control of the issues that you want to talk about, and that you, your opponent winds up running your campaign the, the whole time and never actually regains their uh, feet and, and, or, or the ground under them. So, you know, politics is really the art of, uh, of keeping control of the issue matrix. And so for our listeners, talk them a little bit more about what that issue matrix is for those that may not be familiar. Sure. Um, the issue matrix. So um, for everyone at home, get a piece of paper, draw a big X in the mid middle of it. Up in the left hand side, you want to put um, what you are going to say about yourself. And in the right hand side, you're going to say what your opponent is going to say about you. Under Underneath on the left hand side, you're going to um, write what you are going to say about your opponent, and then next to that, what your opponent is going to say ab about themselves. Within about 85%, you will be able to predict what both campaigns are going to say the entire time. And as General Schwarzkopf said after the desert warm drubbing of the I Iraqis, uh, battles are about uh, you know, applying your strengths to your opponent's weak weaknesses. Uh, and that comes right from the art, art of war also, that what you want to do is you want to minimize your weaknesses. Are those things your opponent is going to attack? You need to minimize those right up front and make them a strength. And you need to make sure you maximize your opponent's weak, weak weaknesses. There's also this big discussion in politics. Oh, you know, people don't, don't like negative camp campaigns. Well, all I know for sure is the only thing worse than going first is going second. So I always want to be the one that launches the, uh, the uh, you know, what, uh, it's not so much attack as it is a definitive presentation of a contrast that is devastating to your opponent. <laughs> now, That's right. Now, some people call that a neg ne negative ad. I just call it uh, a public service. There you go. I mean, if, if they've done it, if it's true, and it's a good faith, just put it out there. It's important the voters know. And if, if yeah, they don't I, already know about it, it's something that's hidden from them. 
Yeah, I had a very wise politician tell me once that the that the only truth you ever see in a campaign is your opponent's negative ads. <laughs> Probably not too far from the truth on a lot of them. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, I agree. So t- talk to me a little bit about how things got started with the cruise campaign, because you came in very early, well before the launch, and were in charge of helping set that operation up. And, uh, you know, it's my opinion that the, the planning stages of a campaign are really where a lot of the, uh, that's such a critical component, right? A lot of candidates put far too little time into that planning process, and they try to get, just get out there and, and make it up as they go. You guys knew that you couldn't have that kind of just make it up as we go mentality. Kind of, how did you guys go about getting ready for what was going to be? You knew already was going to be a really, really tough race. Um, I actually started the day before Ted announced, so I can take no credit <laughs> for all the fantastic, brilliant work that that was done lead, leading up 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 to it. Um, but I I know. Uh, what they basically did was um, uh, J.J. Johnson was the uh, general strategist for the campaign, did a great job. Jeff Rowe, great job. Chris Wilson, great great job. And other key members of the team very wisely identified who they believed the core market was. And in a 17-way prim- primary, um, you really do – it. It is about ID and turning your voters out, and uh, so you know they they very wisely uh, rolled out the campaign in such a way that they believe would be maximum benefit to the widest number of um, voters, and those were value-based voters, um, folks uh, that believed in the Constitution and uh, wanting to position ourselves as the out, outsider, which all of which was done extremely well. And quite frankly, uh, we, all did, we, we all did not suspect the degree to which Donald Trump would be able to live through his own uh, fascinating turn of phrases from time to time. It was definitely, uh, there were a lot of wild cards played throughout that entire election. But I think the uh, I think you guys did an incredible job, and it's uh, definitely something I was proud to be associated with. Talk uh, talk a little bit about what you know your role was like, what you were responsible for. I know as the national political director, you were really in charge of implementing primarily your, your, the ground side of things, right? Well, you know what we wanted to do is is you know um, we we very much understood that the purpose of the primaries and the caucuses was to get to the con- convention. So we set up our entire ground game to be able to influence the convention selection process of who the delegates were to the con- convention. And if you re- re- remember, we were electing entire slates to state conventions and the national convention, even though we had not won, won that state. Right, because uh, because there are a set of rules that each Republican Party in each state puts in puts in place, of which we were the only campaign paying any attention to the rules. <laughs> so, well, it was so, kind of uh, funny because you know normally you know we sit down to play a board game. You and I sit down. We're probably going to read the directions, or we're probably going to lose one or the other. And the Cruz campaign very early on. Not many people were aware of it, but you were literally like the first thing that you had those RPDs do. You know, McClellan and, and Sawyer. First, thing you had those uh, those regional political directors do is, hey guys, go figure out what the rules are to these states because we're playing for delegates and we make sure that even if we win, you know, during these primaries, we need to be prepared to win the convention too. Right. That, that was absolutely awesome. It, it seems like a pretty, which it should be a standard thing, but nobody else is doing it. Well, you you have to remember that also during this process, there was an entire um, mind-boggling, stressful about getting on the ballot in every state. Right. With uh, signatures, petitions, and and all kinds of things. So um, our philosophy always was, well, if you've got to be doing all this hard work to begin with, why not make it worth something more than just just getting sick? Uh, signatures. So whether, um, so 
even if you lost a primary, delegates to the convention were selected through a whole nother other process. And we did very, very well in that process. And our strategy uh, pretty early on was if we could get to a, se a second ballot, Ted Cruz would have been nominated president of the United States because um, a lot of people uh, who were at the convention were only sworn to uh, Trump on on the first first ballot. But that's not the way it worked out. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah, there there was that second ballot we might have hoped for. <clears throat> right. So we talked a little bit about the you know, the Cruz campaign, some of the things you need to do ahead of time. Uh, and we talked about a few campaign mistakes just by way of talking about what you're supposed to do. One of those was stay calm. Don't overreact to criticism. Only react to what you're supposed to. What are some other mistakes that either you've seen or maybe you've committed? You talked about some of those uh, the slings and arrows you've taken. What are some of the mistakes that folks need to stay away from they should know are out there? Well, you know, if you believe you have a good, solid campaign plan, you need to stick to it as much as possible. And don't accidentally start running your op opponent's camp campaign. Um, you know, one of the one of the problems um, uh, that's that some of the other presidential campaigns had is, uh, you know, they let Donald Trump completely take them off their theme and message for long periods of time during the camp campaign. Um, and, you know, even even smaller camp uh, campaigns. Just because your opponent tells you something is important and just because a reporter calls doesn't mean anybody cares. So, uh, you know, it's it's uh, that's why experience in a campaign is important because it does take a little bit of judgment to understand, you know, what is a one day story and what really needs to be responded to and and answered. And here here is the rule, rule of thumb. If you found out. I mean, let's let's just say that that um, if, if you did not know the facts and if you found out or believed that what your opponent was saying was true, would you change your vote? If the answer is yes, you better respond to it. If the answer is no, then leave it go. Um, because one of the things that we like to try and do is if we're attacked for one thing, we'll attack with something else to put the to put the topics back on our playing field. You know, it's sort of that old old expression, attack me with a knife, I'll shoot you with a gun, shoot me with a gun, I'll hit you know, I'll, I'll get a bazooka. <laughs> I mean Right. Yeah, so um, and the the other thing that I would greatly advise folks, and this is especially to the sort of the Facebook generation out out there we completely took the wheels off of a campaign once because our opponent's campaign manager had all kinds of like drunken uh pictures on the face facebook page and that 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 and i'm i'm telling you um if it's out there in the public do domain whether whether it's a political campaign or i know that employers now are starting to sort of mm -hmm. troll people who are applying for jobs and things. So, you know, my, my rule of thumb with, and this is, I, you know, I hate to sound like a 60 year old guy with, with, with grown children, but I'm a 60 year old guy with, with grown <laughs> children. If you wouldn't want your mother to see it, don't put it out there. Cause that's uh, a good rule. Cause unfortunately most of the people doing the hi hiring in a young professional's life is a, a dinosaur like, like me, who's expecting <laughs> an employee to have to, to, to show some restraint and good judgment. Well, that's a really good segue to talk about what you look for in staff, because that's that's a critical part of any campaign. You can't do it all yourself as a candidate or even as a consultant. You talked, you touched on the social media side of that being important. What are some of the other things you look for in a potential staffer, whether high or low level? Um, here, here is a, here is an absolute secret. My first question always takes people completely off guard, and it is, tell me about your grandparents. And then I will say, well, tell me about your parents. And I have, gen I have found that people who, ha people who have um, uplifting good stories to say, to tell about their parents and grand grandparents tend to be good, uplifting folks them 
them, themselves. Um, or if it, if it is not a, a solid up, uplifting story, um, it had better be, it had better be accompanied by a story of personal triumph and overcoming great heart hardships. Um, because you either learn to be a good person because your parents and grandparents help you become that person, or you become a good, hardworking person because you didn't have any, any, anybody to help, help, help you. Uh, the folks who don't do real well in interviews with me are, are uh, silver spooned, uh, second or third generation money who think that their poo poo don't stink. Uh, I will generally try and, uh, you know, hit the ejector button on them as fast as I possibly can. I want someone who has had to work. I want someone who, who waited on tables. I want someone uh, whose first car broke down constantly and they worked to get the second one. I'm, I'm just looking for, I'm looking for people who understand a little bit about life uh, and it ain't easy and nobody's going to hand, hand you anything. So I have been very, very fortunate. And that the people I have um, hired o over the years are value-based, good, honest people who I would trust uh, with my checkbook or my kids or my life. And quite frankly, if you if you hire somebody you can't uh, you know you can't trust with your life, I suggest you go back out in the market and hire someone you can. So, Mark, you've got you nearly forty years in politics. Is that right? Thanks. <laughs> so you got, yeah, you got a couple, a, you got a couple years. Okay. We got one or two years of politics experience behind you. A couple more. No, actually here, here is a true story. I was one of the first high school seniors in the country to run for his own sc school board in 1976. The first person I ever voted for was me <laughs> in, in beautiful scenic Pensacola, New, New Jersey. And the reason I ran is because, um, the superintendent of schools and I just happened to run into each other in the uh, halls, and we got talking about the fact that the school board budget hadn't passed for a number of years, and there were things that couldn't be re, re, uh, re, repaired and stuff. So I ran for the school board with a unique platform. Don't vote for me, but pass the school board budget. <laughs> so uh, there, it, it was a multi candidate race I, if, if i remember correctly the top three people won i think i came in fourth and i spent the whole last week of the campaign calling people asking them not to vote for me but to vote for the school board budget and so that 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 was fun so technically at C, i'm going to be 60 this year i mean so i basically have been doing i've been hawking for votes for 50 years for someone so wow so, yeah, it's pitiful. No, that's that's, pitiful. that's awesome. I need to get a life in my next one. <laughs> I'm going to come back as you in my next life. Oh, my gosh. Don't do that. <clears throat> I mean, your beard would be more impressive. But other than that, <laughs> I, I think you're on a pretty good path where you're at. So my, my point in asking that is, as we're kind of wrapping up here, I want to think back to to that point. You know, when you first started out on this, this crazy wild ride, other than maybe on some days thinking you'd tell yourself, no, no, don't do it. <laughs> what what would you what kind of your meaningful advice would you give yourself looking back there? Boy, um, I think I would have kept better track of all the people I was meeting because uh, you know uh, back when back when I got started there was, there was no contact management pro programs there was no you know laptop computers and all that and. You know, there are some people who have 30 years experience uh, and then there are other people who have 30 uh, that have one year experience 30 times. So, you know, the one thing I can say about myself is every year has been an ad adventure. Um, I don't recommend it for everyone because I've sort of lived my life like a NASCAR race and I've hit the wall a few times. Um, so if I had any advice to give myself, I, I would say, you know what, relax, it'll be okay. Uh, 80% of your success in life is who, is who you marry. So get it right the first time. Um, and, uh, this is going to sound really corny, but you should always be, you should always treat people the way you want to be treated because you're likely to see them 
uh, on the da- on the way down as well as on the way up. So you, you, you always want people to, to leave with a favorable, even if they don't agree with your politics, they at least think that you're a, a good and helpful person who would help them change a flat tire if you drove, drove past them. I think that's solid advice. Well, at least it's good to know that I got the 80% right because I married an awesome woman. So that's at least I'm 80% of the way there. I can pick up the, le- the next 20% after uh, you know, in the next couple of years. So that's encouraging. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, one, one of the, you know, um, uh, you know, the good Lord has blessed me in many, many ways. But when it came to picking, sp- picking spouses, I've only gotten it right recently. So, hey, well, yeah, you got it right now. <laughs> So yep, let's uh, have, absolutely. So where can folks find you online? We got intels.com. It's intels with a Z. Do you got uh, Twitter or any other accounts you want to tell us about? Um, I think if folks uh, go to intels.com or if they want to send me an e- email, my email address is mpc at intels.com. That would be a great thing. Uh, I am one of the, I am probably the worst self marketer on the planet. And I'm kind of old school. The less people know about what I'm doing, the happier I am. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm sure coming on a podcast is a really good way to keep that going. No, no, no. I was, I was told that if I didn't do this show, you were coming, coming to get me. And uh, that kind of fear, (laughs) I just, I just couldn't live with. Well, I will, uh, I'll cancel the hit squad. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. If if I come over, it'll be with a bottle of bourbon and we can hang out at your your cool office and uh, and have a, have a pleasant discussion. Then we have a follow up interview. Perfect. All right. So you got any closing words of wisdom for the audience, Mark, before we head out? Well, you know, in closing, I'd like to say that anyone who has taken the time to listen to what I have to say today, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because time is the only commodity we can never get back. And uh, I would like to think that in some way I might have helped somebody's career today. So I just want to thank you for having me on and uh, would be happy to join you or do anything I can because I think you're providing a valuable service uh, to the political community i do think you need to trim that beard though but hey <laughs> well before i go out block walking i'll, I'll make sure to, to trim it back a little bit so i'll look less duck dynasty ish and maybe a little bit more like you might want to vote for me perfect um, mark i really appreciate you coming on today thank you so much uh guys we're going to have all of mark's content information his email and the intel's website in the show notes so you can pull that up from your phone your computer wherever and we'll also have a lot of information about him and how you can get in touch with him on the blog post that accompanies this at mycampaigncoach.com. So check those out, and we'll talk to you guys again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.